Good morning. Happy Monday. All devices off, by the way. To my far right, Dr. Jim Malatris. To my immediate right, real doctor, Dr. Howard Zucker. To my left, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To her left, Robert Mejica, Budget Director, calls himself Doctor of the Budget. He's not a real doctor. Today is 51 days since the first case in New York, just for perspective, so we know where we are. It's 92 days since the first case came to the United States of America. It was in Seattle and in California. These are the hospitalization numbers for today. Tick down from yesterday, but a slight tick, uh, statistically irrelevant. The question for us is, we are, are we past the apex? We have had a number of days that have seen a reduction, a reduction is across the board. Hospitals also say anecdotally that they have less uh, patients in their emergency room, which, again, perspective, the emergency rooms were way over capacity. It was chaotic, it was hellish. Uh, and the emergency rooms are still at or over capacity, but it's better than it was. The total change in hospitalizations, you see that it's been going down. The three-day average of hospitalizations is going down. Number of intubations is down again. That is great news. Uh, not down as much as yesterday, but down. Uh, number of new people coming in the door with COVID diagnosis is, again, just about flat with yesterday. This was reporting over a weekend. Sometimes the weekend reporting can get a little funky because it's Saturday and Sunday, and uh, they have less of a staff. The reporting may not be as accurate, but it's basically flat. Uh, the question that we initially dealt with at the beginning of this, as the numbers were going up, the question was how long until we reach the top of the mountain, right? Every day it was the numbers higher, the numbers higher, the numbers higher, the numbers higher. The question was when do you get to the top? How high can it go? Then we get to the top, the top turns out not to be a peak, it turns out to be a plateau, and then we're on the plateau and it's basically flat, and then the question was how long are we gonna be on this plateau? How long, how wide is the plateau? The question now is, assuming we're off the plateau and we're seeing a descent, which the numbers would suggest we're seeing a descent, the question is now, how long is the descent and how steep is the descent? And nobody knows. Just the way nobody knew how long the ascent was, nobody can tell you how long the descent is. And that's what we're trying to figure out. The number is coming down, but how fast does the number come down? And how fast does the number come down to where it becomes a low enough number that we have some confidence that we have a margin of error? Does it take two weeks for it to come down? Some projections say that. Does it take a month? Some projections say that. And again, the projections are nice, but uh, I wouldn't bet the farm on them, and I don't even have a farm. Worst news is the number of lives lost. That number is still horrifically high. Uh, if you're looking for the optimist's uh, view, it's not as bad as it was, but 478 New Yorkers died yesterday from this uh, terrible virus. Everyone is anxious to reopen, everyone is anxious to get back to work, so am I. Uh, question is, uh, what does that mean? How do we do it? When do we do it? Nobody disagrees that we want to get out of this situation. Nobody. You don't need protests to convince anyone in this country that we have to get back to work and we have to get the economy going and we have to get out of our homes. Nobody. The question is going to become how, when, how fast, and what do we mean in terms of reopening? With reopening, I want to set the bar higher, meaning the question shouldn't be when do we reopen. 
uh, and what do we reopen? The question should be, let's use this situation, this crisis, this time, to actually learn the lessons, value from the reflection, and let's reimagine what we want society to be. And since we are going to have to go through all of this, and it's not going to be fast, let's at least make this a moment that when we look back, we can say, wow, we went through hell. But look at all the lessons we learned, and look at how much better we made this place from this incident, right? We went through 9-11. We're hellish. Well, we had to rebuild. Yeah, but we were smart enough to say, how do we build back better? You look at downtown Manhattan now. It is better than it was before 9-11. You look at the security procedures that this nation has. We're better than we were before 9-11. We had Superstorm Sandy here on Long Island. Uh, terrible, terrible. Thousands of people's homes gone. Long Island is better today for having gone through Superstorm Sandy. OK, how do we use this situation and stop saying reopen, but reimagine and improve and build back better. And you can ask this question on any level. How do we have a better transportation system, a better housing system, better public safety system, better health system, better social equity, better use of technology? Yeah, people who are working from home, a lot of them are saying, you know what, I should have been doing this all along. You have telemedicine that we've been very slow on. Why was everybody going to a doctor's office all that time? Why didn't you do it uh, using technology? Why haven't we been using more technology for education? Uh, why haven't we incorporated so many of these lessons? Well, because change is hard and people are slow. Now is the time to do it. Uh, and that's what we're doing in a multi-state regional coalition. And that's very important because that is the smartest way to do it. On a more granular level here in New York, we're going to have a reimagined task force uh, that focuses primarily on downstate New York, which has been the most effective area, and uh, led by the state with those local elected officials. Uh, but let's get the best housing experts. Let's get the best transportation ex experts. And let's use this as a moment to really plan uh, change that we could normally never do unless you had this situation. In the meantime, do no harm, and this is my number one concern every day, uh, do no harm, don't let that infection rate go up, and that's testing, and that is watching the dial, right? Uh, we know what's going to happen now. The weather is going to warm, People are a little more relaxed because they see the numbers coming down, and we know human behavior, right? Uh, they want to get out of the house. They want to be more active. And there's a sanity quotient to this whole situation. There's only so long you can say to people, stay in the house and lock the door, right? Uh, they have to go out and do something, and they will. They will come out with a warmer weather, and we do have parks and there are recreation areas. It's not even healthy to stay in the house all the time. But that is going to happen. That activity level is going to increase naturally. When that activity level increases, you can very well see that infection rate spread. Infection rate is primarily a function of contact. You touch a surface and then I touch a surface. You cough, and the droplets go on me. It's contact. Uh, and that's why places like New York City or anywhere you see a hotspot cluster, New Rochelle, it was about contact. People start coming out. They start moving around more. There will be more contact. That contact will increase the virus spread. Watch the dial. Watch the virus contact spread. Uh, you'll see it in the hospitalization rate. To the extent we're doing testing, you'll see it in the testing rate. But remember how thin our margin of error. We were at 1.2, 1.3, 1.4.
That's when the virus is uh, outbreak. One person is infecting more than one additional person. When you get the, the infection rate below one, theoretically, the virus is slowing. We're at 0.9. We have 0.9 to 1.2. That is a very fine margin of error. I don't even know that it's statistically relevant, frankly, because all of these numbers are a little uh, loose. But that's what we have to watch, and we will. And we have to watch this until we have a medical treatment or we have a vaccine. That's when this is really over. In the meantime, I say again to my local government officials, I'm getting a lot of calls from a lot of supervisors, uh, town elected officials, et cetera. They're under increasing political pressure and uh, they're wanting to do things. The state rule is now everything is closed and the state rule is they can't take any action that is contrary to that because coordination and discipline is now key. Uh, beaches, public facilities, schools, parades, concerts, these would all be magnets for people. I work with our other states because frankly, if they open up a beach in Connecticut, you could see a flow of people from New York going to a beach in Connecticut uh, if I don't open our beaches. Or if they have a concert in New Jersey, people are cooped up here, you could see them get in a car and drive to New Jersey to a concert. By the way, you drive to New Jersey to concerts anyway, without COVID. Uh, I told someone yesterday, I ran into a couple in Albany who said we're from Queens. They're in a car eating out of styrofoam trays. They drove up from Queens to buy Thai food in Albany, take out, because they liked the Thai food restaurant in Albany. I said, you drove from Queens to Albany to buy Thai food. Two and a half hours, three hours. Uh, I said, you know, they have Thai restaurants uh, in Queens. All due respect to the Thai restaurants in Albany, they're very, very good, but would you really drive three hours? They said, we just had to get out of the house. We had to do something. So we like to take a drive. So anything that Jersey, Connecticut, New York does can affect everyone else. Suffolk does something. Westchester does something, New York City does something, it affects everyone else. That is the reality. So everything is closed uh, unless we say otherwise. And the most important thing, I just had this conversation with a local official. Look, people need government to work. Government has to be smart. And if it looks confused, between the state and the county or the state and the town, that's the wrong message for everyone. So let's just be smart. Uh, on testing and funding, those are the two areas that we're looking to work with our federal partners. Testing is going to, fund, is going to require everyone to work together, federal and state, state and locals, by the way. We're starting the largest antibody test ever done today. Uh, in New York, the largest sample, but this has to be a multi-level government coordinative project because we have to do this on an ongoing basis. Uh, also on the funding issue, this is uh, obviously a, a unique period in a lot of ways. We did a state budget in a way we've never done it before. Since our state didn't have any revenues, the way we did the budget was we basically said it's dependent on what we get from the federal government. And the federal government had promised funding all along. We said whatever we get from the federal government will determine our state budget, right? Because the state has a 15, 10 to $15 billion hole right now. Uh, and that's never been done before. It basically said, I'll tell you the state budget when I know the state budget, uh, and the state budget is gonna be a function of whatever the federal government gives us. The federal government has not funded states to date. The National Governors Association, bipartisan, uh, 
headed by a chairman, Governor Hogan, Republican, I'm the vice chairman. We have said with one voice, you want the governors to do the job, we need to provide funding for state governments. There's now another piece of legislation they're talking about passing in Washington. Uh, and again, it doesn't have state and local governments in it. But if this week we're going to do a state forecast, if they exclude state government again, our state forecast will project without any federal funds, you can't spend what you don't have if you were to do, uh, allocate the shortfall uh, relatively on a flat basis across need, you would be cutting schools 20%, local governments 20%, and hospitals 20%. And this is the worst time to do this. Now, federal government has said from day one, don't worry, we're gonna provide funding to the states. Uh, yeah, don't worry, but uh, I'm worried because I've heard this over and over again. Uh, and my job is very simple. I have one agenda, I have one, one purpose. I fight for New Yorkers, that is my job. Uh, I don't have any side jobs, I don't have any uh, other places to go, people to see, that's all I do. And I'm telling you, New Yorkers need funding for this budget because we can't do it otherwise. Uh, and look, Washington is saying what? We want to fund small business. Yeah, great. Uh, you should fund small businesses. And they want to fund financial services and large corporations and airlines and hotels. Yeah, that's all great. Fund all those businesses. But at the same time, don't forget teachers and police officers and firefighters and transit workers and healthcare workers and nursing home staff, because those are the people who I fund with the state budget. And you shouldn't make us choose between small businesses and large businesses and people who are on the front line doing the work day in and day out. I would even go a step further, and I would propose hazard pay for frontline workers. We all say, boy, they did a great job, the healthcare workers did a great job, the police, the heroes. Yes, they are. But you know what, thanks is nice, but also recognition of their efforts and their sacrifice is also appropriate. They are the ones that are carrying us through this crisis. And this crisis is not over. And if you look at who they are, and the equity and fairness of what has happened, uh, I think any reasonable person would say we should right this wrong. 40% of the frontline workers are people of color. 45% in public transit, 57% of the building workers, 40% of the healthcare workers. People of color are also disproportionately represented in represented in delivery services and childcare services, right? The economy closed down. The economy did not close down. It closed down for those people who frankly have the luxury of staying at home. All those essential workers who had to get up every morning to put food on the shelves and go to the hospitals to provide health care uh, under extraordinary circumstances, and the police officer who had to go out to keep you safe, and the firefighter who still had to go out and, and fight the fire, those people worked. And they went out there and they exposed themselves to the virus. Two thirds of those frontline workers are women. One third come from low income households. So they've been doing this work, they've been stressed, they're going home to a household, often had uh, two wage earners, one of them is not, now not working, they're, they're living just on that one salary. And after all of that, we see the infection rate among African American and Brown Americans higher proportionately than other groups. Why? Because they were out there exposing themselves. That's why, and you can talk about health disparities, etc. But I believe all the studies are gonna wind up saying, yes, when you were home with your doors locked, dealing with cabin fever, they were out there dealing with the coronavirus. 
and that's why they are more infected. Pay them what they deserve. I would say hazard pay, give them a 50% bonus, and I would do that now. Yes, airlines, also frontline workers. Uh, also, we have a need and a responsibility to get the assistance we need to people in low-income com communities. We have, uh, NYCHA is public housing in the city of New York. High concentration of people uh, in one place, many people in the small lobby, many people in an elevator, many people in hallways, a higher number of people in the apartment, just a higher occupancy. Uh, that's where the virus spreads. We're going to set up a test program in NYCHA where we're going to have on-site uh, health services and testing uh, in uh, the New York City area with New York City Housing Authority projects, working with uh, local officials. We'll, we're doing it as a pilot program to see how it works. If it works well, uh, we'll go fur further with it. Uh, we have, uh, as you see, Congressman Meeks, Congressman Akeem Jeffries, Attorney General Leticia James, Speaker Carl Heasty, and Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz, uh, who will be working on this and coordinating it, and I thank them very much. We're also going to bring 500,000 cloth masks uh, to uh, NYCHA. That is one mask for every person who is in public housing. Uh, and hand sanitizer, et cetera, just so they have the necessary equipment they need to do the social distancing and protection. Uh, personal opinion, not a fact, throw it in the pail. What we're doing here, you know, as a general rule, what we do determines our future, right? As smart as government is, as smart as people are, that's how how you shape your future. But this is cause and effect on steroids. What we do today will determine tomorrow. Uh, and we're not going to need to wait to read the history books. We make smart decisions. You will see smart outcomes in two weeks. We make bad decisions. You will see bad outcomes in two weeks. So when they say the future is in our hands, the future is really in our hands. And we're going to get through this. We, we can control the beast. The beast will not destroy us. We can control the beast. Great news. Uh, we have a lot of work to do to keep the beast under control. And we have a lot of work to do to reopen. Uh, but we're going to set the bar high, and we're going to reimagine. And what we reopen will be better than what we had before. Build back better. Build back better. B, B, B. And that's what we're going to do. Because we are New York tough, and tough isn't just tough. Tough is smart. Tough is disciplined. Smart is united. Uh, and smart is loving. Questions? When will New York release the number of 